Amen. Oh, oh, look about. <laughs> Have you ever had your plans interrupted? Anyone? Anyone's ever had your plans interrupted, canceled maybe? Um, you know, you had everything ready. Everything was organized. And then suddenly something happened, an interruption to the program. I don't know what we're going to call 2020. I don't know when, one day when we look back and talk about 2020. I don't know what we're going to call it. Are we going to call it an interruption? Or are we just going to call it the ultimate example of life? <laughs> you know, that, that things change and programs and plans, they change. But what I want to speak on today is I want to speak on the topic called sudden storms. Sudden storms. As Christians... I think we have, I think as humans, but especially as Christians, we have a responsibility, all of us, to figure out what do I believe? And once I figure that out, what is my appropriate response according to what I believe? I think as humans, we have that responsibility, that you have a responsibility to figure out what are your convictions as a business person, what is the culture that you want to have? You know, you have a responsibility to figure that out and then make sure our actions line up with our culture, with our convictions, but also as a Christian. We ha all have a responsibility to figure out what do I believe? What do I actually believe? About every single area in life, what do I believe? And now what is my appropriate response? I don't want to get too much into this point, but I just think I meet too many Christians, including myself sometimes, where we react rather than respond, where things happen and we just react and we let external circumstances dictate our internal choices. And really all we've done is that we've reduced our convictions to preferences. And I think all of us need to ask ourselves, what do I believe? Right. And once I figure that out, here comes the hard part, actually living it out. Right. Saying, well, if I believe that, then surely it should be reflected in the way that I live. You know, truth is, we cannot control what happens to us, but we do control how we're going to respond. All of us. doesn't matter who we are. We cannot control what happens to us, but we can control how we will respond. I mean, we say things, don't we? We say we believe certain things, and then life happens. We say that... Oh, God is my joy. He's the source of my joy. That's what we say. And then it starts raining on a Monday morning. And then suddenly it's like, oh my gosh. You know, I have no joy. It's like, I get the natural reaction to that. Like, I get that. I, you know. But at the end of the day, you've got to ask yourself, what do you believe? Yeah. Now, I'm obviously making a light of it in terms of an example. But obviously, you could use heavier example. Uh, for me personally, this uh, weekend is not only our daughter's 10-year-old birthday, but it's also the weekend where I remember that nine years ago, my brother, he died in a car crash. That's a heavy day to remember. And, you know, in those moments, you have moments of sadness, you have moments of grief, you have moments of, you know, mourning your brother and remembering the good times. But, you know, when, when bad things happen, when sudden storms hit your life, there is a natural reaction that ought to come out. I mean, we, we should cry and we should feel the pain of it. And it's good for the, even the healing process to have those emotions. So I'm not saying let's just be these, you know, weird Christian super robots that kind of like, I feel no pain. You know, like, and it's like, you know, bad things happening. It's like, I don't feel it. You know, it's like, no, you're weird, you know, because you should feel it. But there should also come a time where you go, I've cried, I've mourned, I've grieved, and now I've got to make a choice. What do I actually believe? What is my faith here? Well, I believe that heaven ex exists. I believe heaven is real. I believe that when we close our eyes on this side of eternity, we open them on the other side of eternity. I have that hope. And if I have that hope, it should change the way that I grieve. The Apostle Paul, he says, oh, we grieve. But we don't grieve like those without hope. We grieve with hope. And he says that in relation to people who have, this is how he describes them, fallen asleep into death. 
I love that. I love that he even describes death as falling asleep. It's so Jesus, because that's how he said it. When they came to Jesus, they said, hey, Lazarus is dead. He said, no, he's not. He's asleep. They're like, you're weird. No, I just get the full picture. I get the full picture. And it changes the way that you respond. We all have a responsibility to ask ourselves, what do I believe? And then make sure that my response and my actions line up with what I believe. James 1, James he says this in chapter 1 verse 2, which is a, it's such an annoying verse. Because he says this, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That's one of those annoying verses in the Bible that you wish you could just highlight with a black highlighter. <laughs> you know, we got our first world problems, but here James, he's in like real world problems, you know. I mean, we have, you know, our first world problems is like my internet is down, you know. Oh, it's lagging. You know, but he says, consider pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perse let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, listen to this, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. This sounds harsh. Because all of us have moments of doubt. You know, and, and we don't want to fall into the extreme where it's like, Oh, if there's, you know, I, remember I, I grew up in a church environment as a kid where it's like, if there was any doubt, it's like this antidote against faith. It's like, there's no way God can answer your prayer, <laughs> which makes no sense because there's a dad in the Bible who meets Jesus because his son is sick and he says, Jesus, can you help me? I believe, but you've got to help me with my unbelief. And Jesus says, oh, your son is healed. So, so there was, there's, something, there's something more here than just there is doubt present. What, what James is talking about is when you are stuck in a mindset where you don't know, is God good? Does God do good? And you're stuck in this mindset between, do I trust God or do I just trust myself? And being unstable can get you certain, you know, you can go so far being unstable. The problem is when you hit the sudden storms. It becomes a challenge when you hit sudden storms if you're unstable. So let's just Let's read a passage in the Bible where we see a sudden storm and see what we can learn from it. Is that okay? Mark chapter 4. It says, That day, when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. Then a furious squall. We don't use that word enough. It sounds like a seagull. Every time I read squall, I'm thinking about like the, the seagull from The Little Mermaid. You know what I'm talking about? Just me? Okay. What it is, is because uh, the, the, the sea, sea of Galilee is a lake. Uh, it's in Israel, still there today. And it's about 250 meters under sea level. And what would happen, and it still happens today, you can be out on that lake and within minutes, the weather can turn. What happens is that you suddenly have a downward pressure of air that comes over the lake, and suddenly the, 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 the weather on the lake just goes from clear blue sky to storm. And you can suddenly get caught in this unaware if you're not, if you're not used to being on this lake. So this furious squall, that's not the thing from Little Mermaid. It's a storm. It came up, and the waves broke over the boat. So it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, which I love that they just put that little detail in there. <laughs> Some scholars believe that Mark was actually um, Peter telling the story to Mark, and Mark wrote it down. And I just love, I love in this moment, they go, oh, look, Jesus is asleep on a cushion, <laughs> you know. <laughs> just get that little detail. It's like, has anyone seen Jesus? He's asleep on a cushion. Stay focused. <laughs> the disciples woke him, said to him, Jesus, do you have another cushion? No, he said, Jesus, 
Don't you care if we drown? He got up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. You'd be a great nanny, great babysitter. (laughs) And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified. They asked each other, Who is this? Even the children are bad. No, even even the wind and the waves obey him. All right, let's, let's go through this. First of all, it says that Jesus said, let us go to the other side. The first question I want to ask you is, what has Jesus said? What has Jesus said? Jesus said here, let us go to the other side. Do you remember New Year's Eve going into 2020? Oh my gosh, was that not an inspirational night? <laughs> I mean, we all, 2020, and so many of us, we used to hashtag 2020 vision, baby, you know, oh, and we had the quotes, and we were going to do this, and, and we all, you know, Google inspirational things to put on our hashtags, and, you know, on that night, 2020, can you believe that we even alive, 2020, man, I thought we were going to be flying around, you know, so on 2020, we had such inspirational conversations, didn't we? Because this is the year 2020 vision. I spoke to one of my friends. He was talking about getting that written on the wall of his building, 2020 vision. We were so excited. And then what happened? Well, 2020 happened. (laughs) And it could be easy to go back and look at some of the dreams we had on January 1st. Some of us even believe that God gave us those dreams. Maybe even we believe that God spoke to us. We had some desires, some dreams, things that we were hoping for to happen this year. And then what happened? Well, a sudden storm, that's what happened. That's what happened. Corona, that's what happened. Minkgate. (laughs) Whatever it is that happened, happened. It happened this year. But let me ask you, though, today... Do you think that any of those things took God by surprise? Do you think that when we sat there and we were dreaming about what could happen in 2020, when we were dreaming about our businesses, when we were dreaming about our relationships, when we were dreaming about what to do with our finances this year, when we were dreaming about all these different things, do you think that God was just like so shocked? Do you think he's like, all right, I want you to do this. This is the dream I'm putting in your heart. And you're like, oh, great. And you, off you go. And it says like, and God's like, oh my gosh, Corona. Who saw that coming? <laughs> oh my gosh, I should never have given him that dream. <laughs> you know, here I'm giving her a dream. You know, your marriage is going to be awesome this year. And now you're locked up with each other. <laughs> How's that going to work? You know, do you think that God was so surprised? Do you think this shocked God? Here he is, Jesus is standing at the side of the lake, and he did not say, hey guys, let's go towards the other side. Let's just aim in the general direction of the other side and see what happens. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say, hey guys, let's go to the other side, and if there's no mean squall today, we're going to get to the other side. He didn't say that. He said, guys, let's go to the other side. Jesus, Son of God, knowing all things, knowing there is a storm on its way, said, let us go to the other side. And I want to tell you today that we might be in November 2020, and you might not have seen the dream of January come to pass yet, but the God who spoke to you in January He spoke knowing about 2020. There was nothing that caught him by surprise. There was nothing that's blindsided him. There was nothing that suddenly has sprung out of him. No, knowing the storm, knowing Corona, knowing about minks, knowing about everything else that's taken place this year. He said, now let us go to the other side. Our God has already factored in the storm. Now, did he cause the storm? No, but he can use the storm. So if he's saying, hey, I want to I see your marriage. I want to see your relationship be all that it can be. 
And you say, how is that going to help to lock me up with my spouse? <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing. <laughs> Maybe this year has caused some couples to talk about things they haven't talked about before. Maybe it has caused some parents to see their kids more than they've ever seen their kids before. Maybe there has been a reset on some priorities this year that, ha that couldn't happen unless everything got reset the way the world has been reset. God didn't cause the storm. Jesus didn't cause the squall, but he used it. He used it. Let us go to the other side. So whatever dream you believe God gave you, whatever it is that you think was dropped in your heart, whether you believe it's something that was there, God actually spoke to you. Now you might sit here and say, what do you mean God speaks to you? Well, we believe God is a speaking God that we can hear from Him. And, if, and even if you can't hear from Him like in your thoughts and in your soul and in your spirit, God speaks to us through the Word of God. That is His voice that is still echoing to us Today, and as we read the Bible, things come alive and it speaks to us, it guides us, it leads us. It becomes a light unto our feet and a, and a light unto the path. And so he speaks to us. And so even if you believe that God spoke to you, I want to encourage you today by saying that that dream is still activated. It's still valid today. So the question is not, what are you feeling? The question is, what did God say? I'm feeling this. It doesn't matter. What did God say? Isaiah 55, 11 says the word of God, it cannot return void. It cannot come back empty. It will accomplish that which it was sent forth to do. So Jesus says, let us go to the other side. The second thing, before we get to the points, which is a little bit of an intro, the second thing is says that he left the crowd behind. Listen, if you're going to get to the other side and, and for... Listen, the other side could mean so many different things. The other side could mean, you know, to build that business you want to build, to build that career you want to build. It could be for your marriage. It could be for your finances. It could be whatever, whatever dream it is for you to live in that lane, to fulfill your God-given destiny, to fulfill your God-given potential. For you to get to the other side is to live the best version of you. If you're going to do that, you must be willing to leave the crowd behind. The crowd. Do you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the crowd? The crowd is the popular opinion. The crowd is defined by the least common denominator. The crowd is, is, is the fickle crowd. The crowd is the, it's the people that one day will say, Hosanna, welcome to Jesus. But the next week will say, crucify him. That's the crowd. The crowd is fickle. The crowd will turn on you. The, the crowd will, will celebrate you one day and call for your head the next day. The, the crowd has no sharp edges. It, it won't try and make you the better version. No, it, it's, it's the lowest common denominator. No challenges. Everyone just, let's just blend in. Let's just be comfortable. There has to be a willingness, if you want to fulfill your dream, to leave the known, to leave the crowd to leave the yesayers, to leave all those people, to leave the crowd behind, to make sure that you have your inner circle, to make sure you have your advisors, to make sure you have the right people with you and Jesus, and then get in the boat in order to go to the other side. So let me just take a few, just a few minutes to look at how do we actually do this? How do we cross over to the other side? What are some of the things we've got to be careful of if we're going to cross over to the other side. I still don't know exactly how I'm going to use this boat. And Jesus was probably in a different boat than this one. Just perhaps. But I'll sit here. Hopefully the whole thing doesn't break. Three things to be careful of. They all start with an F, so you know it's anointed. The first thing is a little bit weird, the first point, but it's the only word I could think of that started with an F that was in... That is, you got to be careful of fuss. Fuss. What is fuss? Fuss is actually a good word. Fuss is distractions. If you look at the definition of fuss, fuss is unnecessary activities. When you're in a storm, whether it's a career storm, financial storm, relational storm, spiritual storm, um, health storm, it's so easy to suddenly 
get busy with unnecessary activities, to focus on distractions. And the disciples, they got into this storm, this sudden storm, this squall, and immediately they forgot what Jesus had said. Jesus said, hey, let's go to the other side. In the middle, the moment they were in the storm, they're like, Jesus, don't you care? You're just lying there on a cushion. You know, don't you care? They forgot what he had said. You see, when you lose focus on your purpose, you become problem focused. When you lose focus on your purpose, you become problem focused. Suddenly we start focusing on all of the problems. And often there's problems that just don't matter. (laughs) Could you imagine if in the middle of the storm, the disciples suddenly go, you know what? I think this boat should be a different color. They're like, what? I think we should talk about the boat's color. It's like, um, that doesn't really matter right now. Like there's a time and a place. And this is neither the time nor the place. <laughs> but so many of us, we, we like that, hey. Like we, 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 we just focus on distractions. Because it's like we can have a quick win here. We can do this. And it's like, no, no, focus on why we exist. Like in, in my context, it would be church, you know, and when we first could gather again as a church, and then we got all these guidelines, we can gather, but we have to do this and we have to do that. You know, it was easy, it could be easy to start getting distracted, not that we were, not that anyone in our church was, but it could be, you could easily start getting distracted with, oh my gosh, we've got to wear masks and keep our distance, and we could start to get focused and start debating about that when it's like, hey, that's, that's, like, that's like debating the color of the boat. How about we just focus on we can gather. We, we, we can be a church. We can continue to worship together and be under the Word. How about we focus on why, on the purpose, on getting to the other side and not debating the color of the boat. But when you lose focus on your purpose, you become problem focused. And this is, it's in this moment that people love speaking into your situation. Have you noticed that when you're in a storm, it's like everyone else wants to speak into your storm? And it's often people that have never been given a voice in your life. It's suddenly like, oh, now's my chance. (laughs) And and I want to encourage you, be careful who you listen to during sudden storms. Be careful who you listen to during sudden storms. Because you're susceptible. You're vulnerable. You you know, you're looking just for any hope, any answer, any whatever. Let's say you're in a marriage storm. And suddenly you've got people like in your life going, yeah, you should leave her. Yeah, yeah, walk away from him. And he's like, no, no, what? Like, no, that's not the advice I need right now. Like that, like be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you listen to. You know, who are you listening to in your life? And when you are in sudden storms, are you making sure that those voices are still a priority? As in, actually, you've got to seek out their advice. The Apostle Paul, he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.13. It's not very comfortable, don't it? I don't have a cushion. Um, in 1 Timothy 5.13, the Apostle Paul, he says, be careful of people that have a habit of being idle, like lazy. And then they go around from house to house. So not only are they lazy, but they are now busybodies, which is a funny word, you know, playing words, from lazy to busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things they should not say. So he's saying, be careful. There are these people, I know it's hard to imagine here in 2020, but there are these people who do nothing, but they're really busy telling everyone else what to do. Hello, social media. You know, Look, I don't mind social media. I like social media. I think it connects us and, you, you, you know, there's a lot of good and there's lots of potential in it. But I think what we have to be careful of is that it's also a battlefield of anonymous, you know, keyboard warriors who have never built anything themselves. But they, come on now. I'm preaching to somebody. <laughs> but they are busy telling everyone else how to do things. You know, I'm going to tell them. I'm going to speak to them. Now, listen, anyone can be a food critic, but I'd rather talk to a chef. Anyone can be a music critic, but I'd rather speak to a musician. 
you know, anyone could be a church critic, but I'd rather speak to a church builder. Anyone, you know, I'll, give me someone that's got blisters on their hands. Give me someone that's got some scars on their body and you have my ears. I will listen to you. But be careful who you listen to during sudden storms. I'm not saying, you, you know, social media is from the pit of hell. I'm just saying, if social media is causing you to be anxious, worry, fearful, cynical, doubtful, you're starting to look at people in a different light, you're starting to look at friendships, your church, your relationships, everything else in a different light, if that's starting to creep in because of who you are listening, because of who you're following, maybe, just perhaps maybe, you should limit it. You know, it is, you know, you're actually allowed to not log on every day. I know I'm setting some people free today. You're actually, there is no law. I, know, I don't know if you know this, but no fines will be issued. If you go like 24 hours without going on, like literally, no one's going to come to your house going, sorry, you haven't been on. Fine. And, and, and the second thing, if you do go on, this is a different, this is a different thing I want to just give to people. It's gold nuggets this, okay? The second thing is, you are allowed to look at something and just choose not to comment. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Up there for thinking, down there for dancing. You are allowed to look at a, you're allowed to look at a post and just go, hmm, and just scroll. Just scroll on. It's like Dory in Finding Nemo. You know how Dory's life advice is just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swim, swim, swim. Some of us just need to just keep scrolling, just keep scrolling, scroll, scroll, scroll. Just keep scrolling, just keep scrolling, scroll, scroll, scroll. It's possible. It's putting it out there. You can pick it up or you can leave it. What is the antidote to all this fuss? It's fellowship. It's the right people around you. It's choosing your fellowship. Choose who's encouraging you. Choose people in your world. And especially these days, boy, it, it, it's so much more of an effort to get around people. Can I encourage you to plan for it? Yeah. Plan to be around people that will tell you what you need to hear and not just what you want to hear. Yeah. I know, that one hurt. That hurt even saying it. It must have hurt hearing it. <laughs> plan to be around people that will tell you what you need to hear, not just what you want to hear. Second thing we've got to be careful of in the boat, the last two minutes, oh God, um, watch out for fear. Fear can hit anyone. Fear of missing out, FOMO, fear of pain. Now fear, it causes us to act irrational. Fear, it's, you know, as a leader, fear, it, it starts to make you just maintain rather than grow. You start to hold on to things. Where well, you started out the year, no, no, we're going to try new things. We're going to try new ideas. We're going to try investments. And we're going to do this, that, and the other. When you have fear, it just stifles you. It's like when you speak to creative people. Creative people, if, if there's a fear of rejection, there's no creativity because I'm not going to step out. I'm not going to try anything new. I'm just going to hold on to what is safe. Fear. This disciples' fear of dying, it was greater than their faith in the presence of Jesus. You see, fear puts their trust in worry, where faith puts its trust in the Word. Fear puts its trust in worry, but faith puts its trust in the Word. You see, both deal with faith, because both are saying, what could happen? Fear says, what could happen if everything goes wrong? Faith says, what could happen if everything goes right? Question is, would you rather be paralyzed by meditating on everything that could go wrong or get energized by dreaming about everything that could go right. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, of love, and a sound mind. 1 Peter 5.7 says, cast all your cares upon God. Why? Because He cares for you. And for those who generally struggle with fear, fear maybe in this season of health, fear of grandparents, fear of your own health, of kids, of loved ones. 
Remember this, that you are loved greatly by a faithful God. 1 John 4.18 says, Perfect love drives out all fear. So what's the antidote of fear? It's faith. It's trusting God. So how do we get faith? There's only one way to get faith. That's reading the Word of God. Romans 10.17 says, Faith comes from hearing the Word of God. Reading the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. You know, we can, we can listen to, to preachers and we can listen to little sound bites on, on social media and they might even give us little goosebumps because there's awesome music in the background. But goosebumps don't build faith. The Word of God builds faith. Other people's testimony encourage us, but they don't build faith. The Word of God builds faith. And I'm back at my weekly begging. <laughs> Please read your Bible every single day. Day, just a little bit. Just get a little bit of word into you because it is building your, it's building your faith. Last one, what to watch out for in sudden storms is fatigue. It's tiredness. Because tiredness, it makes you drop your guards. Tiredness, it makes you drop your expectations, makes you drop your standards, makes you drop your convictions. Tiredness, it makes you go, oh, but is it really that important? Is it really important to read my Bible? Is it really important that we, we maintain this excellence in our company? Can't I just cut a corner here? Can't we just do this? Tiredness makes you start to slack on the things that used to be important. That's why if you're an athlete or in anything in life, really, you get taught muscle memory. You know, if you learn a new sport, if you're learning tennis, you know, it'll be the same hit. Do this hit. Keep doing this hit. Keep doing this hit. And you'll keep doing it. And you're like, I think I get it now. No, you got to get it until your muscle has a memory of it. Because when you get tired, you will start to slack in your form. You will start to slack on your standards. But if your, if your body has its own memory of how to do things, then it's even when I'm tired, my body can just click in. My body knows what to do. In the same way for us, we need to build muscle memory that even when I'm tired, I still reach for the Word of God in the morning and I read it. Even when I'm tired, I still pray. Even when I'm tired, I still make church a priority. Even when I'm tired, I still have my conviction. Even when I'm tired, there is still a standard in how we do things around here. Even when I'm tired, I'm not letting the fatigue to let me you know, be worn down when I'm starting to slack on some of the things that used to be important. The issue is when fatigue sets into our soul. You see, when your body is tired, you just need rest. When your body is tired, you need sleep, you need healthy food, you need a good workout, you need drink lots of water, we get it. But when tiredness sets into your soul, you're no longer tired, you're weary. It's a blanket over your mind. And you can, be, you can even recover to the point where you are now fresh in your body, but your soul is still weary. Galatians 6, 9, the Apostle Paul says, let us not become or grow weary while doing good. Because in due season, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Listen to what he says. He says, let us not become, let us not grow weary. Why is that? Because you don't grow weary overnight. It's like someone that just says, oh yeah, one day I just woke up and I wanted a divorce. That's a lie. It doesn't happen overnight. That's something that's been building up under the surface for days, weeks, months, years. It's just it's something under the surface, in the hidden, in the unknown, in isolation. Something is growing under the surface. You don't just wake up one day weary. No, there is a slow, there's something tapping your energy. Something is taking your passion. Something is, is draining you. And Paul says, beware of that. Don't let, it, don't let it make you grow weary. And I really want to encourage you, church, just, just totally pastorally here, just to say, hey, you know, if you're tired, that's one thing. You know, look at your time. Look at, your, you know, look at all that. That's, like, we know that. But if you're weary, you might need someone else to help you. you. That might be the season where you say no one fights alone. That might be the season where you lift your hand and you reach out to someone and say, hey, could, could, you, could I talk to someone? <laughs> and you might have those people in your world, and that, that's awesome if you do. But if you don't, let us be that person in your world. We would love to help you, you know. And 
That might be to see someone professionally. It might be to see a counselor. It might be to see someone just go, oh, yeah, let's, let's deal with this. It's not a biggie. Like, you, you know, we all go through it. It's okay. But I want to encourage you, don't fight this alone. If you're weary in your soul, in our church, we have teams that, that, that want to help out. And where we don't have the answer, we just try and point people in the right direction. Because we kind of just like, you know, co-wanderers, co, 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 um, co-travelers. Where we just travel alongside you and want to encourage you. So what do we do if we're fatigued? What's the antidote? The antidote is your focus. It's remembering why you do what you do. Remembering why you do what you do. I've said this before, but if you forget why you do what you do, what you do will destroy you. If you forget why you do what you do, what you do will destroy you. It doesn't matter how noble what you do is. You know, in a few months, we're going to move into Falconer building here in Copenhagen. And there's going to be a lot of work. There's going to be a lot of bumping in, bumping out, you know, getting used to a new building. And even doing something as noble as that, if we forget why we're doing this. What we are doing will destroy us. It will kill all our passion. So we've got to keep reminding, stay focused. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? It's for the people. It's for the children. It's, it's for the marriages. It's for my friends. It's for my family. It's, it's so that I have a home. It, keep reminding yourself, why do I do what I do? You know, at the start of the, the, the message, I talk about the double-minded person, the person that hasn't settled on what they believe and. You know, I've said this before, but being a Christian, it doesn't mean that you're not going to face storms. If you've ever heard anyone preach and they've said to you, oh, just be a Christian, it'll be smooth sailings all the time. You'll never meet a squall, ever. They'll just be in Disney. You know, you are going to have smooth sailing all the time. That's actually a lie. Because Jesus himself says, in this world, you will have trouble. But he says, but don't lose heart, because I have overcome the world. And so really so much of us in life is just to remember who Jesus is. Because if you're in the storm and you can remember two things, just two things. If you can remember these two things, you're going to make it through. And that is God is good and God is in control. If you can just remember that I am loved greatly by a faithful God. He is good and He is in control. If I can remember those two things at the same time, if I can believe that, then that gives me peace in the midst of the storm. You see, many of us, we're in the storm and we're hanging on and we're like, oh my gosh, I don't think God is good. He might be in control, but ah, He's not a good God. Others of us, we're like, oh, He's in, you know, He's, he's good, but He's just not in control. <laughs> like He's doing His best. Go, God, go, you know. But if we can understand in the midst of the storm, God is good and He's in control. I don't know why I'm in this storm. I don't know how long I'll be in this storm. I don't know when I'm going to get out of this storm. But I do know that God is good. He's in control. So I know that everything works together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. So I know He's either going to take me through this storm He's either going to take me around this storm. He's either going to kill this storm. He's either going to use this storm. But somehow I will get to the other side. So I'm going to hang on and I'm going to keep being faithful in the stuff that is within my control. But I'm not going to get anxious. I'm not going to start worrying about things that are outside of my control. I'm going to believe God is good and He's in control and we will get to the other side. And that's why every time we get together, we ask people that if you've never committed your life, if you've never connected your life to Jesus, to give you that opportunity. Because when you jump in your boat, when you leave here today in your little boat, we all have our little boats here. And we're all going to face storms this year. The year's not over, guys. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the one thing I want to know is not what is the government saying. The one thing I want to know is not what help packages are coming my way. The one thing I want to know is not what are they doing about minks. The one thing I want to know is not who's leading the country. The one thing I want to know is, is Jesus in my boat. Because if He's in my boat, 
we'll get through this. If he's in my boat, my family will get through this. If he's in my boat, this storm is not going to take me out. If he's in my boat, I can have peace. And I want to pray for anyone here today that you can't say that. That you've been in storms, or maybe right now you're in smooth sailing. I mean, amazing. Good on you. That's fantastic. But I want to still pray for you. And I want to pray that you will open up your life to the reality of Jesus. That Jesus will be in your boat. That no matter what you face in this life, that you can have peace because you know you will never be alone again. So could I get everyone just to close your eyes? Just to give everyone a moment of privacy. And if you're here and you say, hey, Thomas, I've never, I've never invited Jesus into my world. I've tried to do it my own way, and so far I've kind of succeeded, and other times I haven't, but you know, it is what it is. But I'm here. Maybe you're kind of like, I'll I'll do it one day. You know, one day I'll sort that side of my life out, but right now I'm just having fun. I think there's so much more for your life, and you're underestimating what God can do in your life. This is not just about making it through. God has so many amazing plans and dreams for your life, for you to become the best version of you, my goodness. And so this is what I want to do. I want to just count to three. And when I get to three, I want every person who wants to say yes to Jesus, either for the first time or today you're coming back, when I say three, just to lift your hand, just high enough and long enough for me to see it so I know who I'm praying for. You ready? One, don't let this moment slip by. Don't put it off to a moment you're not guaranteed you have. We have right here and right now. Two, I'm not talking to the person next to you. I'm talking to you. Do you know Jesus? There are people here today. You're here for the very first time. And there's others. You've been here so many times, but you've never made this this decision. Well, this is your moment. So when I say three, I want every person who wants to say yes for the first time or today you're coming back. When I say three, just lift your hand in the air so I know who I'm praying for. You ready? On three. Three. Come on, just lift your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Amazing, thank you. Over there, all the way up there. That's amazing, thank you. So good. Anyone else here today? You're saying, I need this. This is my, this is my day of finding Jesus or coming back to Jesus. Anyone else here today? That's awesome, well done. So good, so many of you. I'm only saying that to let you know you're not alone. So good. You can put your... Put your hands down. This is what we're going to do. We're going to say a prayer. And I want to ask everyone to say this prayer together. But especially those of you who lifted your hand. Or you didn't, but you know you should have. Come on, it's not a hand in the air that says, as the Bible says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And in that moment, we find salvation. So just just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my mistakes. But today, I choose you. I make you my Lord and Savior. And from today, I'm a follower of Jesus. I am forgiven and I am free. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Come on, can we congratulate?